My name is Jeff Wong. I'm a spine surgeon at the University of Southern California, and I'm located in Los Angeles. Um, Jens? Good morning. This is Jens Chapman from Seattle, from the Swedish Neuroscience Institute, and uh, I'm speaking from the lecture room at the Seattle Science Foundation. Great. Mike? Uh, my name is Mike Hutton. I'm a spine surgeon from the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital in Exeter, and I'm also the lead for National Health Surgery, Final Surgery for NHS Improvement. Okay. Uh, Neil? I'm Neil Anand from Peter Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Okay, uh, Yang. Yeah, Yang Hai from Beijing, China, Capital Medical University. Nice to see you all, guys. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And and Rod? So um, I'm Rod Eskian, and I'm in Seattle here with Jens Chapman at the Seattle Science Foundation. Okay, and Karsten? Hi, I'm Karsten Bichard. I'm a spine surgeon from Munich in Germany. Okay. Uh, well, let's get right into it. I think I'd like to start with a bit of an update from where you're at. So, Mike, we'll just start with you. Well, actually, we'll we'll start. We'll end with Mike and, and Yong. Um, Jens, why don't you start off and give us an update or what are things like for you in Seattle? Thank you. So, um, we're obviously the first U.S. Uh, hot zone center that was affected by this um, now almost a month ago, three weeks ago. It's been a surreal time. And as spine surgeons who are very proud of our mission to helping our patients, uh, this was obviously a significant reality hit because suddenly we were asked to kind of shut down our very busy uh, surgeries and outpatient evaluations. And um, Spine surgery is in this kind of a weird uh, gray zone where it's not a clearly elective surgery frequently. Um, it's frequently a pretty dramatic or substantial uh, adverse uh, effect of, uh, on patients if we don't intervene. So this is something that our system has struggled with and uh, we're basically very heavily reduced in our surgical volumes. We can roughly do about one uh, case every day, maybe every other day. And uh, we're still kind of trying to rebalance what we can do and what we can't do. Um, so uh, there's been a significant shutdown of all operations, uh, pretty much all outpatient clinic visits. We've switched to video or phone clinics and um, we have to get approval even for our uh, CTs, MRIs, all injection clinics have been stopped. So rather draconian measures. And again, spine surgery is probably different from regular orthopedic surgery in that we have a higher acuity of cases sometimes we haven't found an ideal solution for that yet, but we're still basically operational on an emergency uh, um, uh, footing. On the good news side, in Seattle, the so-called curve seems to have flattened so far. So those are the early uh, uh, hopeful signs that we may hopefully have seen the worst, although our epidemiologists uh, tell us that it's going to be mid-April until we see the true uh, maximum point. With that, I'll shut up. Thank you. No, thank, thanks, Jens. And, and Rod, I think I'd move to you. Anything to add on that? And maybe you can give us an idea. What's it like for the people in Seattle, like outside the hospital? What's it like out there in the streets and things like that? Just to echo Jens's point, uh, we basically shut everything down. Um, and it was interesting because the first patient was just north of Seattle um, in a, in a uh, community-type hospital. And um, within... I think a week, uh, uh, and we also had a nursing home that was affected. Um, and so, you know, within a week or two of having um, uh, these patients be exposed, we literally shut down doing elective surgery. And um, the tricky part, I think, for us was as healthcare providers, uh, kind of on the front line, is, um, you know, protecting yourself but also um, making sure that you took care of the patient. Um, and one thing I've sort of seen is, you know, they talk about the PPEs being used and I can't wait to hear what Professor High has to say, but um, it's interesting to watch the evolution because initially they told us, you know, you don't have to wear anything. It's only if you're symptomatic, but now they're recommending that um, we all wear protective gear, even if we don't feel like we're a carrier or transmitting. Um, so it's it's been very interesting. Uh, and like Yen said, they're predicting for our community that between April 16th and 9th um, is, is going to be the peak. So 
we're still waiting uh, uh, and uh, hopeful that we'll be able to get through this. Yeah. Thank, thanks. Carson, what's it like in Germany right now? Well, we had a first couple of cases at the beginning of the year, pretty early, with a automobile company that had an employee from China. And all these cases were very well contained. They were like 10 or 12, and they had very flu-like mild symptoms. And then uh, these people got discharged and everyone thought, well, that's sort of what it's going to be. And no one was really worried about it too much before about, I'd say, like three weeks ago or so when, when things really took off. Now, from the spine surgeon's perspective, I work in an orthopedic-only hospital. And so elective cases are our bread and butter uh, business. And um, we, without having a large internal medicine unit or so, uh, thought we could sort of get by and treat treat uh, trauma and treat uh, musculoskeletal disorders and keep out of the COVID thing. Now, that uh, strategy has not really worked the way we thought it would. Although up to this point, the hospital has canceled all um, elective cases uh, at the beginning and then we found out within the, the other um, hospitals in our area and in our city that this uh, government regulation was sort of interpreted quite differently. And now people are saying, well, what can be done and is likely to get worse within four months, it could be done now under these circumstances. Now, four months in spine surgery, um, that's a long time when you speak about neurology, when you speak about chronification of pain and, and so forth. So we completely avoid anything that might need ICU capabilities. We avoid anything that might need um, uh, blood transfusions, although we still continue doing tumor cases and that's sort of the exception for that. Um, otherwise, we we run an emergency only type clinic. Um, now, the the government has really changed the regulations for everything. So now all the doctors are basically um, uh, kept centrally in a way that when one hospital has higher demand, they can actually order people and staff from one hospital to go to the next hospital and. Um, for example, our pediatric uh, orthopedic colleagues, they they have basically only elective cases and it can be that they get withdrawn and have to work at, at different hospitals. Now, we, we are in a close collaboration with an internal medicine only institution. So they take up the, the majority of the COVID cases and the intensive care cases. And we get those for uh, sort of which are safe enough not to be on ventilators again, but sick enough to not be discharged home. So it's sort of an in-between situation. We all um, are beefing up our ventilation capabilities in the entire country. And um, Germany has a lot of hospital beds and has a lot of doctors in the European comparison for sure. And uh, we have a lot of ICU and ventilation capabilities and um, we still hope that there's a way we we get by and avoid situations like in in Spain or Italy or or elsewhere. But uh, no one can be really sure if that actually materializes or not. Okay, great. And Neil, I think you're back on. Why don't you give us an update on just Los Angeles? I am. Thank you. I think to record that Jens comments, we pretty much are a complete standstill. Cedo's pretty much got very proactive. Well, two weeks, three weeks ago, shut everything down elective. Uh, protocols were established, daily updates around the clock. I think we had the benefit of China and Italy and what was going around the world. And uh, we would get daily updates. Right now, it's only emergency surgeries, dedicated ORs for COVID patients, dedicated floors for COVID patients, dedicated staff, dedicated PPEs. Uh, it's really all in a teamwork that's been going on. And it's been pretty impressive how proactive, I must say, the hospital has been right in front. They think, we think, the peak will probably be May, the first week of May or latter week of April, since we seem to be a week or two behind New York. On the same side, there seems to be some talk of 
California having got some sort of a handle on this, and maybe and hopefully they're better prepared and have the time to prepare for it. So that's where we are. It's pure elective surgery and all virtual clinics. Great, great, thanks. And and Hani, I see that you're back. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and give us an update of what's going on in Spain? So I'm a spine surgeon here in Las Palmas de Gran Canaria so it's in Spain. Uh, well, the, the situation here is similar in general uh, as, as uh, other countries. Uh, you know that Spain now is the second or the third uh, worst situation uh, from the virus. Uh, so, but I, I want, we, we have cut down uh, on the uh, on this emergency surgery. We don't have we, we trauma infections and, and, and tumors, but trauma there, we don't have trauma now because nobody you know, is locked down. So we do only very few emergency surgery, fortunately, only very few. I uh, want to differentiate Spain. What's different now in Spain than other countries? It is similar. I mean, it's high, the number, but what's the different? The main difference is uh, the health care workers, we have 15% of infection. It's too high. It's double as compared to Italy. It's like three times as compared to China. So I wanted to analyze why this happened. Well, I think because, because we, uh, we we didn't have a good equipment. We have a contradictory uh, orders from the government. Uh, we don't have the rapid uh, test uh, and culturally uh, in Spain we 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 would like to to gather to speak to talk all all the all the I mean anywhere you can you can you don't eat alone so maybe this is this is maybe the main reason why do we have more percentage of doctors and nurses uh, infected by the virus. Uh, and all the other issues are the same. We we, we are not doing this, uh, uh, elective surgery. Uh, we have only very few cases of emergency. And we are, I mean, as spine surgeons, we try to avoid and to go out of the general uh, hospital part where there are patients, infected patients are there. Uh, the only problem that I want to, uh, to, to ask all of you, what you do if you have an emergency case, do you consider it positive or what you do with it? Yeah, no. and Hani, thanks for that. We're going to, that'll be the next topic that we're going to get okay. into because I think okay. there's some subtleties in that, uh, okay. but you do bring up an important point. What is the risk of um, uh, the healthcare worker as well as the spine surgeon? Yes. And I just saw an email from Dino Smart, who's from Rush, who did a survey, and, and I don't think I'm letting the cat out of the bag. He, he found a survey of about 301 international spine surgeons that the infection rate uh, of COVID is 0.06%. So it's still a rather low, but obviously we might see that number increase. So let, let's move on to Mike. Mike, why don't you give us an update with what's going on in the UK? So um, I just thought I'd give you a few facts and figures uh, in the UK. So we are, um, we are very similar to, um, Oh, I won't change my slide. Why is that staying on too? There you go. So we're, we're, we're following a pretty similar trajectory to everybody else. Um, over the number of deaths we've had since our first de death was recorded. And we've gone through various stages of lockdown in the UK, very similar to other patterns. And if anyone doesn't believe that social isolation doesn't work, um, you can see in the UK, everyone was moving around in London, certainly, to start with. We were then told to work from home. And only when we closed the pubs, and restaurants did things quieten down significantly. And since our total lockdown a week ago, there's been very little movement in London. Um, it's very interesting listening. I mean, one of the main reasons I'm involved in this is to listen to you guys and learn what other people have done because like most things, this is a novel thing and we're seeing patterns that I've already heard on the call are very similar to other parts of the world. So these are our regions. This is the number of cases per 1 million population. Uh, and you can, and these are all the sub boroughs within London. So you can see that London has got a much higher incidence and growth rate of, of COVID cases. I'm based in the southwest um, uh, in Devon, and we've got a very, very low number of cases of COVID. And our greatest concern at the moment is London actually has quite a young population, 
whereas the southwest is a little bit like the retirement home of the uk and people tend to move down here and a lot of people from london have either second homes um down in the southwest or the, and we have a much older population and our our provision of intensive care beds in the south west is much less than london uh, per head of population and the big concern and i think this happened in italy to a degree is that a lot of these people then start migrating down to the southwest and then we have a, a, a real flurry of what's going on. What what we've taken as a group, well, one of the, we've got a number of disadvantages with our healthcare systems. It's interesting, we'll all have different healthcare systems on the call, but one of the things that we've got quite, one of the advantages of a national healthcare service is quite e easy to disseminate information amongst all our group quite quickly. And we've got a situation where Public Health England tells us exactly what we're supposed to be doing in relation to our care. I'm not to say for one minute that we haven't had some miscommunications or the spreading of news that may not be scientifically correct, but we have got the ability amongst us to actually come up with guidelines. So this is all the clinical leads uh, coming up with guidelines on how we should be doing our remote working in secondary care, by which I mean people who would normally come to hospital. And we've also been able to, for all surgical groups and in fact all sort of patient subgroups, we've been able to come up with guidelines for how to manage people, and in this case, spinal surgery. Now, I don't, I don't, for one minute, sort of pretend to say I know what the right thing to do is, and that's what I'd love to discuss later. I'm sure we're going to get to that, Chad. But this is where we've progressed things uh, along spinal surgery. So we're certainly not a normal state. A few weeks ago, we'd shut all elective non urgent surgery. So we were. Going through our waiting list. I think we just lost them. Mike? Sorry? Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. So, so, um, uh, so we've, we've gone, we do have waiting lists, unfortunately, for our slowly progressive myelopathy, myelopathy patient of three or four months. So, a couple of few weeks ago, we were going through our waiting list and making sure that anyone who had a chance of progression. Uh, neurologically, such as your spondylitic myelopathy, were put through ahead of time and tried to cancel all non-urgent surgery. And the stage we're at in my hospital at the moment is the emergencies only. So we've gone down to specific working groups where we're just dealing with emergency surgery. And where we're not at yet is this group here, which people have always mentioned. And in the UK, this is the group of patients that we are not going to operate on. We've sort of worked on, which is essentially patients who we think have a high chance of requiring a ventilator afterwards who are not very well to start with and i suppose the controversial area is patients uh, who who are in this state you know we're in this stage from a capacity to ventilate and who have metastatic spinal cord compression um and we're, we're proposing that when we get to the stage where we haven't got ventilators for young people that we stop operating on patients that have got metastatic spinal cord compression so um, that's where we're at in the UK. Great, great. Thanks for that update. And then uh, Professor Hai, why don't you give us uh, an update of what's going on in China and how you guys managed it over there? So, uh, so far, the China has been, uh, the, the most of uh, the uh, cases has been recovered. Uh, the, the total case is uh, 81,000. And you, you look at the, the the days from the daily new cases is in the uh, late January and early mid of uh, February, and then start to quite long, uh, quite long time. And uh, for those uh, the death rate for the for the out of uh, Hubei province, there was uh, only uh, zero eighty six point percent, but in Wuhan is higher. It's a uh, it's a uh, five percent right now. Ninety five percent of the uh, patient are re recover. You look at the curve are different uh, with the uh, now in in Italy or United States. It's um, starting from almost uh, end of January. The government has start very strict uh, uh, regulation to almost shut down the whole Hubei province and uh, most of the area of China. So the case being uh, quite down. Mm significantly uh, what chinese government done there has two different uh, area one's for the epic center wuhan city and hubei province they start from january 24 
is not locking only locking down the city, province, and shut down all the traffic out and into the province, and also shut down the community. The people in community at their apartment or home, they are only allowed to get out for grocery or food shopping for one or two times a week. And in the meantime, there are forty-three thousand plus medical uh, house workers with their own personal protective equipment and and ventilators uh, coming from all over the country to support Wuhan. The government built a two new grand hospital in ten days with two thousand six hundred beds for those in the critical conditions, and also they. Convert the convention centers, the stadiums, to the、uh, hospital. Almost thirty thousand beds for the minor cases, and other than Wuhan, thirty-one provinces they send the medical team one-on-one supporting to the different cities in Hubei province. That will, you know, give a large support for the local because at that time every center. They have almost forty、uh, thousand patients at a time, so the the medical system、uh, is almost collapsed. And this support、uh, gave a lot of、uh, hope. That's that's for the reason. For the other places in China, the community lockdown, the、uh, government restricted non-essential out. But I was、uh, coming back from United States on the twenty seventh of January, and then start then I have to go to hospital every day. But other than that. And most of people are staying at home, and we have designated hospital in Beijing for the、uh, COVID nineteen patients. Every hospital we have a, a fever clinic. When the patient they have a fever, they go to the clinic. The clinic is in the designated building, isolated from the main building. Every contact person with the COVID patients in Beijing are traced and are quarantined. And tests for all the close person, and also they use the social media,、uh, internet, and newspaper to provide information which community they have the COVID nineteen patients, how where they has been, which、uh, supermarket or which shop or which place they have been, at which day, what kind of period of time, so everybody know. Which location, which area? They there was a patient going through because there's a there's a one shopping mall in one place within three hours. There has been fourteen patients was found in the same place. The first patient, then in the next three hour, the people go over there. They have. Another certain patient got infected, so that's why in China everybody is wearing mask because the virus will in the air for at least three hours. So, and also during that that time in Beijing, all the people coming from Hubei will be tested. If they are normal, they will be home quarantine for fourteen days. That not only at home, it's isolated single. Less or no contact with family because in the China patients, sixty percent of the patient they are family transmission. Sixty of the patient they are family members also got infected. So that's、uh, if you don't have a, a condition for quarantine at home alone, there's a、uh, hotels provide for you and on your own expenses. But all the treatment in China for COVID nineteen patients. Are covered by the government. For our hospital, the hospital has designed three zones. One is the red zone, which is the fever clinic and a quarantine ward for the suspect patient. Because our hospital is not a designated hospital, so once the patient got diagnosed, we'll send to the designated hospital for treatment. So also for the patient safety. The hospital purchased one portable CT unit in our hospital. That's the first one in Beijing. So all the fever patient, they don't go to the main building. They will get a CT scan and the blood test at the fever clinic, also the quarantine ward. 
and the template taken by the hospital entrants and also taking before patient enter the waiting area. Our clinic, the normal clinic and the emergency clinic has never stopped. It's open normal, but taking temperature when you're entering the hospital entrance, taking temperature when you're entering the waiting area. And also for the last month, one month, everyone going in the hospital, if you want to see a patient or you want to admit, you have to use your cell phone to look at your trace for the last 14 days. If the four, you are not in Beijing, you have to go back home, self-quarantine until 14 days. So that's for the outpatient. For inpatient, you have to no contact history with patients. During the, before you admit, you needed to do a blood test and a chest CT scan. If they are normal, you will admit in the isolated the buffer ward building. The hospital cleaned one building, four floors, for the patient to get screening. That means you have to do the two times the testing in between more than 24 hours, another chest CT scan. Because a lot of patients, even they are negative in the testing, they have a chest CT scan positive, And they are also with the COVID-19 pneumonia so after that there is a there's a group of panel with five experts containing of the infection disease the radiology respiratory medicine emergency medicine and one of uh, administrative people they all agree approval and then you can have a surgery and all admission to the normal world we call green zone so the green zone are different with before we are we are get the last patient in one room one or two in one ward and the emergency surgery only for critical condition and also we have a three negative pressure operating room these are for the emergency surgery at the first one or two months during this come uh covid 19 uh, pandemic for our patient our hospital surgery during the last two months, we only had a 30 plus cases in, in uh, February and the March because January is the Chinese uh, New Year's uh, holiday. We have a seven days holiday. So normally in February or March, we will have more than 400 cases uh, every month. The only for open closed fracture, neurological uh, progressive uh, spine conditions, and some L people with uh, a video compression fracture, very painful. No elective surgery for last two months. But start from this month, uh, actually it's, a, it's the last week. Why don't we move on to some questions? And, and Jens, I'll, I'll put it to you for the panel and we'll start with you, Jens. Um, what's, we, we all know the, the guidelines. There are things that are certain emergencies or things like back pain that obviously are completely elective. What are the things that you're doing in your hospital? How are you determining which ones you're doing? And then why don't you also tell us what pre precautions you're taking, if any, how you've changed the, in the operating room, um, if you've changed any of your routines? These are great questions. Thank you, Jeff. So let me start with the last first, protection. <clears throat> the most vulnerable group for us is probably our anesthesiologists. So they started something new, which I thought was very clever, and I'd love to hear the reaction around the world. <clears throat> Everybody, Around intubation has to leave the room for about 20 minutes. Uh, all of our rooms are negative pressure now. And uh, the patient gets intubated, and only after 20 minutes are we allowed to come back in. So when the air exchange has happened, the same thing happens during extubation. So everybody, when the patient's about ready to get extubated, leaves the room for 20 minutes, and then a deep scrub clean takes place. So that's the, uh, the first and foremost thing for our anesthesiologists and all the staff to diminish the aerosolization. In terms of the approvals process, this is quite honestly contentious. Uh, again, up to getting MRIs or CTs approved, um, we have a very hard time doing that. Um, and it is contentious because the boundaries, especially for spine surgery, have not been clearly established. Um, we do have, for instance, still uh, ongoing cancer care. So just the other day, a patient with quadriplegia from a tumor was taken to the operating room and hopefully is making some recovery. But I sense, for instance, that this would have not happened in other countries. 
uh, the patient is still on a ventilator now, so this is uh, not a trivial decision-making process. Um, as surgeons, we obviously uh, do now wear um, uh, protective equipment pretty much all the time when we're in public spaces. So I'm not wearing a mask right now, but I carry my mask in my bag with me at all times and uh, will wear it together with gloves for the protection of my patients and perhaps myself. Uh, so this has not been policy until very recently, and the policies always change. We're looking at other countries for other tips. With that, I'll shut up for right now. Thank you. Neil, why don't we go to you? What, what cases are you guys doing? What's your procedure for deciding what cases to do? And then what are we doing in the operating room, if anything, that's different than your normal routine? Well, thanks, Jeff. I think one of the first things we did was sort of lay down what's emergent and what's urgent and what's elective. And honestly, the emergent case is really unstable. Traumatic fractures, uh, obviously progressive neurological deficit in a tumor patient and or epidural abscesses. Even myelopathy is sort of stepping back from on recommendations that you heard from others. And there is a panel that discusses that. The case is submitted, panel decides, and only then does the patient even go to the OR right now. The operating rooms are designated COVID-19 or non-COVID-19. The COVID-19, I believe there are three ORs now that operate only on that. Every patient is tested times two who gets admitted, so we know. The, the transport is reserved. The elevator is, 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 the, is, a, is a designated elevator. Uh, to Jan's point, I think that's brilliant. We did the same thing. There's a 15 minute stop after the intubation extubation. And the reason being, that means no, everybody leaves the room, comes back after 15 minutes. And the reason being, the engineers tell us every three minutes, the air is cleaned out in the hospital. So given that, you assume the air is much cleaner when you come back in. The teams are designated COVID-19 teams. There's one circulator in the room and one runner outside. The runner then tells everybody when coming in or going out is that job to clean the corridors, make everything safe so the patient can be transmitted in or out. The circulator stays in. Uh, it's, a, it's everyone's gown, including N95 masks, and uh, pretty much terminally cleaned after that. So I think that, that, and everyone wears a mask now in the OR, in the hospital. Anyone walking around the hospital has to wear a mask now. That was something new we implemented in there. So we're trying our best to learn from all of you and be very proactive. Great, great, thank you. And Mike, uh, why don't you give us your experience in the UK? What uh, cases are you doing? And then are you doing anything different in the operating room? So um, we are, uh, doing exactly what Jens has said in terms of the intubation and extubation and what other, what other speakers have said. We are, um, uh, it's very interesting the concept of what protection equipment to, to use and whether the patient has or has not been tested. Um, it takes us about four hours to get a test result back. So we are presuming that they're COVID positive if we have a time critical emergency rather than sit there and wait for four hours. Um, and in which case we're using both FP3 uh, equipment and, and striker hoods or hoods that we with circulating air. And there was a lot of debate about whether that was a better or worse thing to do. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the actual type of cases we're doing, at the moment we're doing emergencies as people have spoken to. What we haven't quite, what we have nailed down is, is what we're going to do if things get to the point where we are uh, having to make some very difficult moral, uh, moral uh, decisions. Our workforce has been divided completely differently. So we only have what we've called pods. So we have three pods where we've got multiple specialty, subspecialty people in each pod. So we're on a, a, a week on, two weeks off, and we all sort of uh, have some backup there for, because one of the other concerns is if, is if we run out of actual spine surgeons, we've only got six of us looking after about a million people in this region. And if that, you know, we have two or three go off, suddenly that workforce is going to be depleted and that skill set is going to be depleted. So we've incorporated an awful lot of planning ready to do things and actually some backup as to what's going to happen if people start falling by the wayside with illness. Yeah, great. Thank you. And Hani, anything to add from Spain? Uh, yes. I uh, First of all, uh, I, we changed our informed consent because the scenario now is different and uh, you have to tell the patient uh, and it's a new scenario. So the informed consent is very important and, uh, and it's changed. 
uh, second, second uh, yeah, a complete uh, uh, protection equipment for everybody. If you don't know, and you don't have the possibility to have the test, we behave as if the patient has the infection. So, uh, I, and you treat the patient and you leave the patient as if it has the virus infection. And uh, we try not to operate patients, even, I mean, uh, if they may need ventilation after surgery or ICU unit also, we try all our best not to operate on him because there's a deficit of, of, of these machines and, and, and it's, it's a problem, real problem. And finally, I want to, patients with tumors. Patients are very special because they may need radiotherapy or chemotherapy after surgery. So very, very, very weak patients and they may have easily catch the infection. So we, we try not to operate. This is my what to do. And if we have to do any patient, we have to strictly follow the instructions of, of, of the protection for the patient and for us. Yeah, great, thank you. And Karsten, um, give us the experience in Germany, but also I want you to comment on um, the pain management side of, of spine practice. One of my colleagues that works at another university here in Los Angeles, who's a pain management doctor, was actually encouraged to do outpatient injections to get rid of people's pain, to keep them out of the emergency room, which I thought was a little kind of counterintuitive. So maybe you can give a comment on what's going on in Germany, but also on the pain management side. Well, regarding the things in the hospital, um, I can pretty much copy what everyone sa said. We've divided our team into two completely, which have no contact with each other and change like every two days. Uh, so we make sure not the entire department is um, is infected at the same time. Um, right now, up to my knowledge, we have not had any COVID positive surgical cases so far. I'm sure that's going to change over time, but then we would adhere to the protocols we've already had uh, had heard before. Um, now every person in the hospital has to wear a mask. We have security outside all the entrances. They are all screened with a with the uh, the temperature taken, and um, if there's the slightest um, suspicion then they are taken to a specific uh, uh, mock-up emergency room area where they are screened and and um, treated in special protective gear um, the rest runs fairly normal in terms of case selection i can only um, echo what we've heard from from all over the world we're doing and stable fractures we're doing tumor surgery and uh, we're doing progressive neurology um, degenerative cases um, we're not doing anything that requires an icu or prolonged ventilation um, post-op uh, now in terms of of uh, interventional um, um, treatments we have more or less completely stopped doing that with very few exceptions mainly for the reason uh, one it most in all cases it's being fairly select or elective and the other aspect is the the steroids um, we do not want to run the risk of uh, immunocompromising the patient even to the slightest degree more and um, giving steroids at that time is, um, is is not an option now what is interesting is that the um, government agency that basically um, uh, licenses all the all the uh, private practice offices they um, these practices are ruled that they have to stay open all the time to ensure that the the general public has access to medical treatment at all times so a lot of things do not actually end up at our clinic which would usually do end up because people try to avoid the hospitals unless they are in, in significant pain yeah. And um, I'd like to ask a specific question to Jens. And certainly, if anyone else wants to chime in, um, please feel free to do so. But Jens, I was watching a different webinar and Marinus de Kluver from the Netherlands mentioned, uh, he almost seemed to contradict himself, but he said, if you're not that affected right now and you have a, sur a surgery like a tumor or something that's kind of urgent or it's a bigger case, he said, get it done now before the, the spike hits. 
which could be a little counterintuitive because he later said, well, but if they have a complication, it's going to take up resources. But, you know, that's a situation we're kind of in in Los Angeles where we've got some cases we haven't seen a huge spike. We're anticipating this. What do you do about the case that's like not an absolute emergency, but it is kind of an urgent type surgery? Does that make sense to get it done now or just postpone it? Great question, Jeff, um, as always. So we've had exactly the same discussions here. And we're also basically very carefully having to monitor our uh, surgical resources. Our gowns and things like that are now very heavily scrutinized. And for the first time that I've ever experienced, uh, we get a daily measure on how many OR gowns and things we have now. So this personal protective equipment thing next to the testing, which was the first big issue has been a huge deal. So what we're doing now is uh, I see about 10 virtual patients a day to try to talk them through just these things. And then I turn around and have the same conversations with our selection committee. So this is a very difficult process, as said earlier, but clearly getting uh, patients done early is a big deal. In addition to the things already mentioned, I want to point out the following factors now. Number one, we don't want to have patients admitted to the hospital for a prolonged period of time. That would be a very big problem because, again, the surge here in Seattle is expected to happen within a week or two. So they have to be able to have a finite stay. Secondly, something that I did not think about uh, was nursing homes. Our nursing homes in our state are shut down because, as Rod had said earlier, the ground zero in uh, the U.S. was a nursing home north of the city here where there was a literal explosion with a very large dissemination of the disease through first responders, unwittingly and unknowingly at the time. So all nursing homes are pretty much shut down for transfers. If a patient cannot predictably go home, we have to unfortunately say no to surgery right now unless we can somehow figure out another alternative. So that's a little uh, uh, new angle that we had not thought about. The final thing is blood transfusions. Uh, we had a critical shortage in the beginning because basically the entire blood supply had to be considered contaminated. And now the testing is available, our blood supplies are slowly coming up again. So blood supply in nursing homes, and again, then how long are they gonna stay in the hospital and how much protective equipment do we predictably have are the big shortcomings. Thank you. Okay. Um, may I ask a question? Now we have, um the selection, like you said, uh, of the cases you're doing, that is happening within the hospital and an expert group or a panel. Um, we don't have that, but we have places in Germany where actually each case that has been done has to be sort of post-operatively submitted to a form and is controlled by, by the government. And if they see that you're not adherent to the no elective surgery policy, then you get fined for that. How is that around the world? Honey, you had your hand up. Did you want to answer that? Yeah. Well, I want I want to, a, a quick comment on, on, on operating patients with tumors or uh, in, in normal situation, you, you, it's a complex surgery and we, you may have some complications in a normal situation. But now if you have any complication, it's very difficult, very difficult to, 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 to deal with it. To treat the patient. So, in, in 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 my opinion, I would recommend not to do unless it is very very necessary. Because any complication you have with a tumor patient, particularly in tumor patient, uh, you 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 have problems with the administration with the patients. No family uh, trust the patient because now there there is restriction of movement of everybody in many countries. So I would not recommend uh, that. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, well we, we here we don't have a fine because it is not allowed by the administration. If you do elective surgery uh, here in, in most of the public system where we are, they don't allow you to do it. You know, you have to justify. And morally, it is if I mean, we, we, we don't hide cases. We don't we don't uh, change the protocol. So we don't do it. Okay. That should not be done. I, I do want to be mindful of the time. We have about nine minutes left. And so I do want to make sure we run through two questions to the panel. And, and uh, Neil, I'll start with you. How are you dealing with your outpatient clinic? Which patients are you seeing? Is it all telemedicine now? How are you screening that? And we'll just go through the whole panel. And I'd say it's 99% telemedicine right now. The outpatient surgery centers are open, but I think, again, we've been very selective about it. There are some surgeons operating there. I think, but I think the point I'd like to make honestly is most of our patients are elderly patients. 
And I think we got to consider what's going to happen to the patient. You're now going to operate a patient and expose them to COVID and they are highly susceptible. I think that's something I tell my patients right up front. Do you want to take that risk or actually bear the pain you have? It's a hard choice. And that's a choice I think we all need to make. It's a really difficult choice. But to me, that's become very important, not admitting a patient so that they get sick now who were not before. Okay. Mike, your thoughts on that topic? Uh, I would agree that um, nearly everything now is telemedicine. What we've used it as an opportunity actually to go through all our current waiting list of patients to be seen. And uh, we have three simple triage of what is look like. Gosh doesn't need any of the telephone conversation. The middle grade is a telephone clinic, which actually has been highly effective. And from that, we do have to, we do feel there's a few patients that you just have to see clinically to decide exactly what's going on and trying to filter out those patients who have serious uh, charts of neurological deterioration. But that is very, very few so far. Okay. Uh, Rod, how are you dealing with the outpatients? Anything to add? Uh, no, but uh, we sort of, we basically shut down the clinic um, and are doing everything is virtual right now. So we're not, done, um, we literally, in fact, maybe to a fault, we first stopped doing surgeries electively and then kept doing clinic. I think looking back on it, we probably should have stopped doing clinic and finished our, you know, inpatients. And then, and then we kind of, I think Mike showed a great slide where they transitioned from doing elective um, to uh, uh, semi-urgent, urgent, and then, and then now they're only doing emergency. And then now they're only doing elective emergency. Yeah, Carson, anything to add on the outpatient side? We are still running a urgent slash emergent clinic. So we're not getting, doing any follow-ups or any of the routine stuff. And when people come and have, have significant pain, we still see them. Uh, the rest is telephone and some telemedicine. Honey, anything to add? We shut down the, the, the patient's clinic and all what we can do by telephone. We have the list. We can see the x-rays. We can give instructions by telephone. And we don't see any outpatient uh, by the moment. Okay. We have five minutes left. And I want to take one of these questions because I think this is an important question from the audience. This is from a, a Heidi. And we'll start with you, Jens. What are you doing to protect your staff, you and your family personally during this crisis? And... Um, uh, sort of how are you dealing with this? Are you, are you providing any services for your residents, fellows and staff and things like that? Thank you for the question. So we very much try to uh, keep an academic schedule going and uh, we've actually intensified that we're going to have a virtual journal club with a couple of other medical centers this Friday and uh, we'll have uh, participating centers hopefully join us. Excited about that. Um, our research efforts have intensified. Um, we have to limit the number of fellows in cases because they want to protect our uh, resources so much. So this is a big deal now. Surgical exposure has become substantially diminished. Some of our fellows are probably going to stay longer. In terms of personal protection, I um, obviously am extremely cognizant to want to not infect anybody. So I very much uh, try to gel and uh, in the hospital walk around with a mask and gloves now and exchange those. When I come home, I completely change uh, from uh, my hospital outfit uh, in kind of a mudroom area. We've kind of created a transition zone and uh, shower down and then only then enter the house. So thank you. Great. Mike, what are you doing in regards to that? Well, I, I was going to ask the generic question is what are people, uh, I'd love to have a test that tells me whether I'm immune at the moment because that would make a big difference to my ability to provide care and a test that tells me whether I've had it because I have uh, a wife that's an anaesthetist, and I have three kids, and um, I'm actually more worried about what she's exposed to than me as a spine surgeon. The reality is it's quite easy for me to do a lot of what I'm doing from home, but I saw that um, that we that in China that they were actually staying away in hotels. Uh, Neil, what are you doing in that regard? I think a couple of things. The residents, I just want to point out, divided the four teams, four residents each, they stay on call for a week and get off for two weeks. The logic being, if they turn positive, you know that by then. So they rotate. Morning rounds is one-on-one, -on -one, just two people. The rest is virtual. 
all clinics and all, I mean, all rounds have become virtual. They're all Microsoft team meeting right now. And, uh, and in terms of, uh, uh, in, 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 and in terms of like we were talking about, you know, uh, changing clothes and things like that, I think everyone pretty much we tell them, shower before you go home, change, shower, either in the hospital or a separate place, or before you get home, like Jan said. I think that is a very big issue, protecting your own family. And I know a number of doctors are infected right now, all over yeah. the world. Yeah. Rod, are you doing anything like that for your own family? Yes. Um, so I go home every night um, and shower. And um, like Jens was pointing out, we sort of have an area. We have a mud room. And I basically just take all my clothes off and then go in kind of the back way. My wife hasn't quarantined me yet um, because she's a pediatrician and um, I'm actually more concerned about her because she's doing clinic all the time um, and we stopped doing clinic. So um, we're trying to be very careful. Great. Arston? Yeah, I can, I can echo that. I mean, does affect a lot. Take a shower once you're home and... Um, yeah, try to keep away from things. Ani? Yes, I, I try to uh, have my gloves uh, as soon as I go out. I, I put a mask. I know that um, it's not mandatory, but I, I try to um, I, I use it. And I stay in my office as much as I can. I, don't, I try not to, not to. And back home, I have a shower. And uh, at home, it's funny because any any symptom or cough of any member of the family, they look at you as if you are the source of the infection. They look at you as you are you have the, you 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 brought the, the the virus at home. This is this is something well, to be taken into into consideration. Yeah. But I do the same as as as, as all the all the panel. Yeah. Well, um, I think we're out of time. Uh, it's been an hour. Uh, I do want to thank uh, the Spine Science Foundation Television, uh, Jens and Rod, for offering up the platform for this. I, I thought it was a very educational uh, webinar. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers for taking the time and sharing your information with us. I think we lost Professor High, but I think it's pretty late in China right now. And I want to thank uh, all the people for signing on and, and doing this. And uh, Jens and Rod, I, I commend you for offering up this platform, and I look forward to more of this type of programming where we can share our ideas and comments. So with that, I think I'll officially conclude this, and, and thank everyone for coming. And everyone be safe, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jens. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.